I guess it's okay without the. I mean, you can want to move the mic. Yes, yes, we do. We live. We're live. Yeah, we're live. Woohoo! We're live. We're live. Yay! We're live with hot coffee. Welcome to midweek mochas. Go ahead and grab whatever warm beverage makes you feel alive in the morning, and join us for our weekly check-in. So, every week our topic of conversation is generally based on something I um, write for my blog, lampstandforlearning.com. And this week I was talking about a key task that is important, but it's almost less of a task than it is a mind shift. You're looking confused. I'm very confused. Okay. So what we are talking about this week is delegation. Right. Did you turn off the AC? Yes, I can turn off the AC. Okay. Thank you. It'll cut off soon. Okay, that's cool. All right. So, this week, what we are talking about is the importance of delegation because you cannot do it all. And it may be at times that you're looking at someone else and you're thinking, but they do it all. It's like, no, no, they don't. You may not be seeing what things they have delegated, but anyone who is doing something successfully is delegating a lot of stuff. And in homeschooling, it is no different. So there's different things you can delegate. The most obvious is that you can't teach multiple people, multiple classes, and also cook everything and clean everything and still have any time left for yourself. So one way of delegating is figuring out if there is something like getting a meal prep service or a housekeeping service that helps keep up with some of that stuff, kind of like how your school had a janitorial staff in a kitchen, that might be one thing to delegate. But I think the thing that I'd like to talk about more is delegating classes. And I think that a lot of people, it's like, wait a minute, you're a homeschooler. I thought the whole point of homeschooling was to teach. And the answer is no. The answer is that when you are homeschooling, what you actually are is the headmaster or headmistress of a private school. And that means that sometimes you're stepping in to teach. A lot of times you may be stepping in to teach. But more importantly, what you are doing is picking your children's teachers for that child and for the classes. You're, right, you're des designing the course of study and you're picking out who is teaching them and how. So over the years, we have done actually quite a bit of this. And one of the ways we have done this is um, just using things like online classes, free class, free things like Khan Academy are one way to offload a portion of your teaching where you stop having to actively teach. Someone else is doing the lecture. Someone else is doing the testing. Your job is more about helping to keep your student on track and helping them work through problems when they run into them. Um, but a different way of doing online classes is actually to find schools that do classes online. Um, we've done this for Latin for several years. I think that was what actually started us looking at using online classes as part of how we teach. Yeah. Um, and I think what it actually began with is that there is a series of Latin classes taught by Dwayne Thomas through Compass Curriculum. Is that Com Compass Classroom sells Compass his Classroom visual Latin series. series and, and also sells his Word Up Vocabulary Builder series. Both of which are excellent. Um, I will highly recommend Word Up. If you're trying to do some Latin and Greek roots work, it's fun. He'll spend an episode on just two words, one Latin, one Greek. So uh, light, um, 
or, or vision or water or something, one in Latin, one in Greek. And then we'll go through a number of words that come from that. And it's a great way to do vocabulary building. But because we had discovered Dwayne Thomas through Compass Classroom, uh, we ended up for a few years um, uh, doing some of his online classes with Latin. Yeah, he launched his, um, I mean, we, we simply had a point where we had too many things going on mm -hmm. for either of us to teach even really elementary Latin to any of the kids. And our oldest was beyond elementary Latin. Um, and while there was certainly a time where I could have, you know, handled that, I can't do that and, you know, work um, uh, at the time outside the house as well. So um, we found Dwayne and then we found some other um, online courses. We found some teachers we were really happy with, but not necessarily some, uh, not, not, not necessarily the, the host school program. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm really, really particular about how Latin ought to be taught. Very particular. Um, but, um, you know, one of the great things about having access to the internet for all that people, um, can, can raise legitimate concerns about aspects of it. One of the very positive benefits is that the world is now a source of teachers and students. So... Our oldest is basically finishing high school. He spent the last four years reading and discussing in a seminar style class for the last four years, the great books of Western civilization through one school program, um, through a different one. This one out of Italy uh, with a, an acquaintance of mine uh, who's one of the living masters of living Latin. Uh, that is to say, Latin that is spoken and used in everyday conversation, as well as the way you would typically learn a modern foreign. Like if you went into a, the average Spanish class, um, senora or senor, whoever it is, is going to be talking to you in Spanish all the way along, all the all along the way, not just telling you about Spanish. This is the way they're teaching Latin, where it's being treated as what it is, a language. And he had an introduction to ancient Greek that used the same methodology through the same folks. Um, we should really put uh, School of Latin A. We definitely um, will. In the show notes. Um, we also had the uh, classes that we took through the other one. Uh, they're based in New York, I think it is. Oh, yeah. Um, Let me think. What was pa Paideia? Paideia, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we will definitely need to put the, that one. They're in. based in New York City. Um, there's some folks based. There's a couple of different ones based in Italy, but the the one our oldest was doing um, at one. He's had classmates from all over the world. He's had Spaniards and and Africans, like 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 sub-Saharan Africans and um, uh, South Americans. I think uh, Argentina and I want to say Peru. Um, He's had classmates call in from um, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, one of the, Polynesia. Yeah, one of the fascinating things about doing the online class is that a lot of times they tend to be U.S.-based, but you, you, you start meeting people from all over the world and from different walks of life, and particularly with something like languages, you're, there's really no age limit on the student. And the other thing I want to stress is, is, and this was, this is certainly a concern of ours even now, is that when people start talking about delegation, at least for myself, I immediately think money. I've got to spend money. And certainly and, for some of these, we did pay. Yeah, there, there are definitely it, it's it, the the worker is worth his wage. Um, uh, everything we've looked at charges what we think is reasonable tuition, and we make it work for our budget. Um, there are more and less expensive options depending on what you're looking for. Um, for example, one of the key texts that we've been using for Latin is a textbook called Lingua Latina per se illustrata. I'll remember to put it in the in the notes. And when we discovered that, we thought this is one of the best textbooks we've ever found. And, and we, we found it in college, yeah. even before we were we were talking about um, homeschool. Well, we were talking about homeschool. We were talking about homeschool. We, were, we weren't even children. married at the time. Yeah. We were talking about whether or not we were going to get married. And if we got married, what kind of a life did we want to build? And one of our friends was doing her senior thesis on Latin pedagogy, on Latin pedagogy. And she critiqued the way our university approached the teaching of Latin 
um, in her master's thesis, and it was built around um, the arguments for using uh, Hans Orberg's uh, Lingua Latina per se illustrata. Yeah. Well, when we started looking for tutors of one kind or another, whether it was an online class or a private tutor, uh, we knew that we wanted to find something that was using this approach. And since then, we've discovered that, you know, you can find on YouTube people going through some of the early lessons and doing a read through and helping and helping a student understand. And so if you're just trying to get a taste of something before you go and shell out for a class, you can actually yeah. get a feel for who are these people? What is this method? Is this going to work for us? And do I have enough willingness to try before you just immediately dive into something? And it works for topics other than just Latin. Oh, if yes. you have a thing for ancient history, that is a rabbit hole on um, YouTube and other streaming sites that, that, you you could that there's already more video content than any small group of human beings could watch in an entire lifetime if they did nothing but watch streaming videos and 24/7. That's, and actually, history is another way that we've gone ahead and done a, a good deal of outsourcing because again, we've moved less from the lecturer than the proctor in yeah. that case, and we've done that a couple different ways. We have used Tom Wood's Liberty Classroom, um, from which you. Um, we ended up purchasing a lifetime membership, which basically gives us f full access to everything they produce. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, yeah. Um, but we have also done, we've used a lot of uh, great courses from the, the teaching company. company. Um, um, lots and lots of the great courses. And that's, and, and our people. library has a bunch of those too. So yeah. we've been able to check out of the library yeah. ones that we weren't sure if we really wanted in the home, our home library. Uh, and that was actually what helped us to figure out. We've discovered that way that there's certain of the professors that they work with that we really like. And anytime they've got something, it's like, Ooh, Ooh, they've got a new one and it's on Vikings. There was a series I remember being shown in middle school um, in search of the Trojan War. Yes. Um, it was a, a documentary uh, filmed in the early 1980s and hosted by British um, journalist Michael Wood. I remembered seeing it on probably video cassette. Almost certainly. When I was cassette. when I was in middle school in the what was that, the late 1980s. And it was already a fairly established thing by then well i went looking for a dvd years ago and couldn't find it found it on youtube all four parts so we hooked up the the laptop to the television television through rca cables at the time yeah. it was pre-hdmi <laughs> yeah um and we we watched it and then eventually i did find a video uh a dvd reissue that the bbc did with several of his other works um so his we, one on alexander is actually really his good one his one on in the footsteps of of alexander the great is also fantastic in tracing the conquest of alexander largely on foot um and that was uh, yeah, there's, there are a lot of ways you can get at the information once you recognize that part of pursuing a course of home education is about creativity and getting creative in delegation, delegating not so much what's being taught, but being judicious in who's doing the teaching, what you want to emphasize or de-emphasize. We had a we had some friends years ago. They ended up forming a co-op that then sort of grew into a cottage school. Mm -hmm. um, and and those are kind of loosely defined terms, but essentially a co-op is a group of homeschooling parents who come together and they pool their resources. Some may contribute a little bit of money or a space to host it and you know snacks for it. Some of the other folks involved will say, you know what? I'm well-educated in the sciences. I'm very experienced and I don't need to be focused on my job. You know, if I have a, a, a W-2 job or I have the flexibility of being, you know, self-employed, I can carve out this time to teach sciences to these kids. But because I've focused on maths and sciences, I, I didn't read any of these books and I don't, I'm not comfortable with literary analysis. We had a friend who loved- 
professional editor, yeah. loved literature, happy to teach literature, needed someone to handle all of those things that, that involve, you know, What's now called STEM education. What's, what's called STEM. It's like, but, because but, because what ha ends up happening in school is that you tended to have, you know, the people who consider themselves mathy and the people who consider themselves, you know, the soft stuff. Which is unfor an unfortunate consequence you know, English of the way we educate you, children. You either, did you either felt that you were the sort of person who, you know, excelled in the language-based stuff or in the numbers-based stuff. And if you were one, you tended to not be the other, and you tended as a result to, you know, put all of your emphasis and interest into one area. One of the other great things about pursuing a course of home education is it gives you the option to avoid that bifurcation in educating your own children and cultivating their skills and talents. Yeah. This is a way of producing that so-called renaissance man, that person like some of the professors we had in undergrad yeah. who could make their own instruments, play their own instruments, had degrees in things like physics and English literature, taught both wonderfully. Um, he'd lived abroad. I think um, uh, the, the one in particular I'm thinking spoke of spoke number of, uh, number of yeah, languages. Yeah, spoke a number of languages. And several of the, the teachers I had in high school and in college were, were very, very similar. Yeah. Um, there's a quote that quotation that I love from, from Heinlein, Robert Heinlein that, that ends specialization is for insects. And in the course of it, it goes through this whole host of, it, you might consider this like a, a bucket list of, of skills to acquire, but they're not before before you call yourself a competent adult. Yes, and it involves everything from the most basic things like child care to you know writing poetry to fighting war and everything in between, and and that realization on a ship, change a diaper. Yeah, and, and so you've got sort of this huge range of things and what you're aiming to do is being able to cover that, but you're not an expert in every single thing and you don't have to be. I remember when I was first talking to someone about the possibility of homeschooling frequently when someone's first looking at it, if they haven't been thrown into it sort of like so many people did in the last two years where they just found themselves at home, whether they wanted to be or not. Yeah. But that one of those sort of big hesitation points is like, I'm not sure if I could teach fill in the blank. Well, you don't have to. What you have to do is find a teacher. And that could be if you've got a high school student signing up for a community college course, and you can even do lab sciences that way, where you know, you know, you can outsource your science class and have a fully stocked lab for that class, even as you're teaching the subject that you are passionate about individually and signing up for a video lecture series or something else. You can do a mix of different things. You find a co-op like the one your, um, your our friend was in. Um, we've done uh, co-ops. We've done a co-op for that was primarily aimed around physical education because it's really hard to get a soccer game going with two kids, um, or, or or to teach you know the basics of you know basketball and play horse and stuff like that. You can get something horse. to. It's it's that game you spell H O R S E with a basketball. It's it's a basketball based game. I've never heard of this. Oh, okay. You went to weird schools. I went to a public school at one point. Yes, but that was like in high school. That they don't do that. That's a, it's an elementary level thing. Oh yeah, I don't I don't ever remember that being taught in in the elementary schools I went to. Yeah, I mean my my elementary school taught us high lie so. You were in Florida, though. No, that was in Maryland. The Maryland school taught you high line? Yeah. Wow. And lacrosse. Well, lacrosse, that makes sense. Uh, very well-rounded. Um, we've also done a, um, a homeschool with our church that was fo uh, a homeschool co-op with our church that was focused around sort of arts and crafts. Um, designed around the liturgical year. We have a friend of ours who directed a play for a different homeschool co-op. Yeah. Uh, in order to help the um, the students in that one better understand, I forget what Shakespeare play it was. She directed them in, but but and that was a a wonderful uh, thing. And then we've also done a couple of I, I would almost consider them online co-ops. Um, yes. Yes. Um, 
not quite co-op, but definitely sort of an o- online online enrichment programs. And mm-hmm. and so so if there's a take home to you know the last twenty minutes or so of rambling, it's that. It's not on you to deliver all of the information to your students. I don't do everything that's put on my plate at work. My boss doesn't do everything that's put on her plate at work. Yeah. She has to delegate to me and others at my level. I have to delegate to others who are are newer on the team and trying to learn processes and procedures and how to do this. That's how stuff gets done. No sports team. I don't. I don't care if we're talking about. Um, you know, pick what athlete you might think is the goat, as the current acronym has at the greatest of all time. Michael Jordan. If you want to talk basketball, or Larry Bird. I think there's a debate about that online yeah. these days. Mike Tyson for boxing, or Rocky Marciano for boxing. Um, you know uh, what? What's uh, 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 Brady? Tom? Tom Brady, the quarterback. Yeah. Okay. None of these people are doing all of this on their own. They have teams. In in the case of somebody like Tom Brady, he very clearly has a team. There are offensive linemen that keep the other team from dragging him to the ground and pounding him. Yeah. Um. Uh boxers have a team of coaches and advisors and trainers who help them achieve peak physical condition. Um, If you've ever watched programs on like celebrity transformations for movies, the actor is told you will show up at 5 a.m. at this grungy pool in Manhattan for at 5 a.m. for the next three weeks to learn the swimming sequence you need for this 30 seconds of film we're going to shoot. Um, that was uh, Scarlett Johansson when she was doing the the water um, the water ballet the in, water ballet in, in Hail Caesar in yeah Joel and Ethan Cohen's Hail Caesar. What you see that appears effortless and individual is the result of a team. The next time you're watching a movie, and and it's easiest to see this with movies and television. Yeah. The next time you're watching a movie or a TV program, sit through the credits. If If you're watching it on something like DVD, pause it periodically and read every single name. Let it scroll. See how many people were involved. There's catering and craft services because none of these people are doing their own cooking on a day-to-day basis. There's, um, you know, actors are famous for getting chauffeured around in 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 limousines or or cars. That's because of a whole host of reasons having to do with production rules. If an actor gets into an accident driving a vehicle to a set, the whole production gets held up for weeks or months. You've got hundreds, if not thousands of technicians yes who set up the lights set up the cameras change the lenses change out the memory cards or the film stock if you're shooting on film you got guys who hold mics you've got women who set up pyrotechnics and then detonate them you've got a whole army of of people who produce things and then so an army all, of people doing things before that all happened to make sure that everything arrived where it needed to and another know. army who come in and clean it all up afterwards yeah All of these things that allow Tom Cruise to come out and look like Tom Cruise and do what Tom Cruise does, or Brad Pitt, or I don't know, um, uh, it's the result of teams working together. Business projects get done the same way. Sports teams work the same way. Home education is no different. And what you are doing is you are... You're the team captain. You're choosing the team. You get to be the coach. You get to pick the players you want on your team. You get to call the plays. The goal, instead of necessarily scoring points per se, is to help invite your children to experience the wonder and potential that the world has to offer and to equip them with the tool set to adapt, adjust, and overcome whatever obstacles they encounter. And if you're feeling exhausted, it might be because you are trying to do too many of the team roles. Um, I'm not good at arts and crafts. I love crafting, but I can't make them up to save myself. 
So two different things that we've done with our kids have been a lifesaver because they brought in that element of things like crafts, whether it was with the um, with the church one where we've got one specifically oriented towards, you know, faith things, you know, learning about different saints, learning about different festivals. Um, but also we do one that's more of a sort of online enrichment. And there's a little bit of stuff aimed around, you know, vocabulary building and and literature and learning about all kinds of things. But there's always a craft each month. And that's huge because I love doing things like with, you know, beads and clay and felt and whatnot. I can't make them up. And that one's- You don't have to. I don't have to. I don't have to be the super creative person who's always got an idea what to do and be able to, you know, hey, it's like, here, kids, here's an embroidery project. I you spent years trying to make the house look like Martha Stewart lived here. And, and before you finally accepted, that's just not us. No, it's not. And it's not my skill set. That's not where I am best. Um, an honest assessment of your skills and the humility to say, hey, I need help here. And then the creativity to figure out what's the solution that works with my budget. What's the solution that works with my education goals? Yeah. Um, remember, time is a more scarce commodity um, or resource. It's not even a commodity. Time is a more scarce resource than money is. And even if money is scarce a little bit of creativity can still save you time. Whether it's teaming up with another parent who's equally scarce on the uh, on the on the resource of money, but they're like, "You're good at this. I don't know, have any clue how to do that. Let's trade." So, and and in the same vein, um, we've got one child who's very interested in like blacksmithing and weaponsmithing, like working a forge and shaping metal. And I remember being interested in that as a teenager or young teenager. I mean, uh, find me a teen boy who isn't interested in swords <laughs> and medieval and ancient type stuff. Okay. Anyway. Um, but where I remember my parents being dismissive of that interest, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, who do I know who's got a forge in their backyard or knows somebody who does? We're in Texas, so there are there's arts a, and crafts living museums in the area. There's arts and crafts where living museums. blacksmiths still work to this day. And there's also stables, and a blacksmith to do the most basic smithing of making horseshoes is still a staple in this state. But with, with helping encourage that particular yeah. child to dive into something like blacksmithing, that's going to cover metallurgy. Well, that gets you some physics, that gets you some chemistry. Um, You've got a historical aspect as you understand, you know, this is this kind of forge and it's been being used for so long and it was an improvement over this technology that existed beforehand. My brother-in-law, when the COVID lockdown, he teaches at a, a prep school up in New England. Yeah. And he was stumped because he's a ceramics teacher and a sports coach at this prep school. Two things that are very much hands-on. Yeah, it's kind of hard to do those when everybody's confined to quarters and no one can get out and run around. So he and I spent, I don't know, what, 15, 20 minutes one day just kind of talking yeah. through. And I said, it, are, are, are there things you can cover that you know because – this is a passion for you and you've developed expertise in this area. Can you produce a few lectures that'll at least, because at the time we thought it would be two or three weeks, not however long it's been. Um, at the time we were thinking, okay, what can you come up with that'll cover two to three weeks of like the history and development of ceramics or ceramics techniques. And you, and at that point you can start touching on what's the chemistry of glazes. What's, what's going on when you fire pottery with different ways of doing it. One of the, the potters we were an undergraduate with, she did her, her undergraduate major in ceramics. She got bacon from the cafeteria and she wrapped some of her pots in bacon and fired it in bacon to see what happened when the chemicals in the bacon burned off at the temperatures in the kiln, what kind of patterns they made on the, on the they pottery. They were very pretty. They're very pretty patterns, but it did make us nervous to eat that bacon for the rest of our time in undergrad. <laughs> yes. So again, you can get creative and 
part of getting creative is delegating. Recognize you aren't being expected to do it all. No one is asking you to, to do it all. You are, as, as Laura said earlier, you are the headmaster or headmistress. You're the coach. You're the general manager, even really, of, from a sports team perspective, even more than the coach, in that you're supposed to get the people who need to be on the team. You don't have to be an expert in everything. I was like, there are things. Latin. We both took Latin. We both actually took a lot of Latin. Technically, we could definitely teach the introductory levels and even some of the sort of mid-tier. But that's a lot of time. That's a lot of study. There's opportunity costs. And there are other people who have specialized that we can enlist to assist us if Latin is that important to us. Yes. Um, and and similar for any, any area, whether it's finding a tutor or finding a co-op or finding a, a lecturer or online school that you can team with and getting creative about, you know, what are, what's the goal and what's the way to achieve that goal? And that it's not all on you to be an expert in everything and do it 100% on, under your own steam. It's not cheating. And that's actually the thing that always I find funny. That's a big hang up you had. Well, it's it's one that I had, but it's also one that I find that it's 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 not unlike our kids who would like try to do Khan Academy without listening to the lectures because they thought it was somehow cheating to learn how the math was done. <laughs> And and I don't know where that came from because I I actually specifically told them watch the lecture. You should let them watch too many cartoons that are that are talking about cheating in a school context. Right. And one of the one of the big discoveries is the recognition that it's not cheating to help your kids write an essay. You are a writing coach. It is not cheating to hire a tutor. Your job as a home educator isn't to be a teacher. It's to find the teachers that are right for the child and for your family and your goals. And for certain seasons and certain topics, you may be that teacher. For certain seasons and certain topics, it may be getting out into nature once a week, once every couple of weeks, and going on just a family camping trip where you don't talk about a single thing that has any apparent association with school but that time and that attention and that that time in nature at Liberty, um, one of the the schools I went to, yeah. we had a weekly trip to. I and mean, we were in the city, but they would take us outside the city. I think it was a Girl Scout camp that we we had access to, and it was very unstructured once you got there. Yeah, once we got there, we got off the bus and we walked to a certain area, and we were required to spread out to where we couldn't see anybody else, and spend some time just being quiet and still and we were required to write a journal entry in our comp books at the time mm -hmm. and i don't know that i still have those books but i remember seeing insects crawling along leaves and and you know rabbits and whatnot i had a deer walk i don't know within four or five feet of me at one point yes there there are actually deer in urban philadelphia yeah my 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 parents have a house that backs onto one of the big parks in Philadelphia within the city limits and deer will frequently come out. And at least until they put the fence up and my mom switched to plastic flowers, they would come and eat her flowers. Yeah. Um, so. But you, what the, the point where there was that they weren't, you know, giving you a lecture on the plants no. or the animals. You were just there to observe. And there, there were, there were some lectures, but those were, rarely done out on site the whole point of the day out at shelly ridge every week was to just get us what would now be called unplugged but of course this was you know before the ubiquity of devices and internet connections and so on and so forth but it was still unplugging from the urban environment we were accustomed to mm -hmm. and um, I had friends who grew up duck hunting in yeah. Southeast Louisiana, or they had one of one of my friends' dads was a um, was a commercial fisherman, and so yeah, they'd go out fishing and trawling in the Gulf, but they'd all they also had like um, oyster beds and um, uh, uh, crawfish ponds that they that they farmed out in a rural area, and every couple of weeks 
my friend wasn't available to do, you know, sports or hang out with us on the weekends because, you know, as soon as he got off of school Friday, he and dad hopped in the truck and out they went to go tend all of those things that help support the family and then provide Gulf seafood to put on your table wherever you lived in the U.S. And there's that part where you're like, how on earth do I put that on a transcript? And the answer is you don't worry about that. What you recognize is that, however, when they go and study things like sciences, like biology and in, in ecosystems, they already have a concrete a, yes, experience and, that the abstract can build on. Yes. And that those are going to enrich and bring that in. And, you know, if you've got a family friend inviting your kids to go on a camping trip, that actually is school. And that's a little bit of outsourcing where if you, know, you team up with someone to do something like get out into nature because you like to see your nature through a plate glass window and you recognize maybe your kids need to have that outdoor time, that may be another way to sort of delegate is find a friend who's much more outdoorsy than you are and spend and have that outdoor time build on it and create get that concrete experience. So again, begin with the end in mind. Yes. What are you trying to do? What, why are you educating at home? What's the goal? What's the vision for the outcome? What does an educated child look like? And that's going to differ. There was a, a, an article in one of the most recent um, HSLDA court reporters that was about um, the shifts in why people choose to homeschool. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to, you know, if you talk to any five homeschoolers, you may end up with five different end goals. You could end up with 10 different end goals <laughs> if you talk to five homeschoolers. They're almost as bad as economists. Yes. Like the old saw about find me a one-handed economist. Yes. Well, on the one hand, on the other, okay, well, now you've only got the one hand. So. Yes. So you're going to find different reasons, but once you have that knowledge of why you particularly are choosing to school, then you need to figure out how to get there. And part of figuring out how to get there is what are the acceptable methods? What are the unacceptable methods? What's the budget I have to work with the time budget, the, the monetary budget. Um, and then logistically, um, uh, certainly when gas is $3 a gallon or even $2 a gallon, Logistically, going to a co-op across town, whatever that means for you, is a completely different conversation than when it's five or six or, you know, God forbid, eight dollars a gallon and rising. Um, when I was living in Philly as a kid, I did a lot of activities because I could get on. I had a I had a transit pass, mm -hmm. so I just got on the bus starting at eleven or twelve years old. I went all over the city. Now I can't imagine my parents letting me do that today but i know there are still kids today in philly who are doing that mm -hmm. would i uh, even if we had public transit in, in our town would i do that here in dallas the dallas area probably not mm -hmm. um, but again it's going to depend on the child um it's going to depend on what your goals are and it's going to depend on the constraints for achieving those goals but once you recognize that part of those constraints is that you don't have to do everything then you start saying, okay. How do I delegate? What do I delegate? To whom do I delegate? And how do I objectively measure the success or failure of this delegation effort? And then you iterate through and not everything's going to be a hit. Um, there, was, there was one of those sort of enrichment things that we had signed up for and the kids just really didn't click with it. We liked the presenter. We liked the material, but it just didn't read for the kids. Yeah. So. You know, and, and 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 not everything's going to be successful, no. and that's also okay. And, and and I mean, even within say something like the teaching company, great courses uh, video series, we've liked some. We found than others. some that the kids ask if there are more lectures by these professors, and there are others where I'm crawling out of my skin to get through a 30 minute episode. And it's like, you know what? This is not worth the stress. Mm -hmm. No one's enjoying this. No one's learning or retaining any information. The video is not provoking good conversation. Let's ditch this one and move on. And Life is entirely too short. And that's the point where you're, you're very grateful that, you know, you're not at the mercy of one particular school right. and their staff. You do have the freedom to say, okay. Use that freedom. Use that flexibility. Yes. You can school when you need to. You can school how best you need to 
for your child and your family's needs. Yeah, you get to the end of the semester and you found that the experience using a particular online school didn't work for you. you Change. Don't, you don't have to go back to them next year. Uh, you you find something works great. Jump for joy because that's that that's something that you can rely on for a while. That's actually a, a, probably a good thing to end on, given that we're really coming up on time. But one of our our middle children, the one who's really interested in like becoming a blacksmith or or maybe a martial artist or martial arts blacksmith, um, <laughs> he wants to be Kai from Ninjago. <laughs> yeah, I, I really think that that probably sums it up, yeah. and that's not a bad goal for him to have at this point yeah. in life. The challenge we have is trying to figure out how to get him there. Well. Following in the footsteps of of um, one of his older brothers, we put him in a Socratic discussion class for the last year, and it was a good class. They they gave age appropriate excerpts, like two or three paragraphs each. Much less intensive reading schedule than the high school one. And you the 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 students were expected to read it through, think about some discussion questions, write a hundred word response to one specific prompt that was assigned submit that and then the following you know uh following week have a seminar style discussion with their classmates and a moderator about the passage they had read and the response they gave and so on and so forth and where our oldest took like a duck to water to a lot of this um you know the the one who wants to grow up to be kai from ninjago has just chafed at the whole experience um and that reminded us that, you know, not every approach is appropriate for every child. I think that class is going to work great for his sister this oh, coming yeah. year. Um, for him, we need to find some other ways for him to encounter material that he's interested in. And from there, unlock those doors to the stuff that he wants to learn. And it's not a, a thing of, you know, well, we're just not going to do a whole lot of liberal arts or great books. It's just the approach is going to have to be different. Right. So college. I wouldn't put him in the great books program that our oldest is just finishing no, up. No. <laughs> but we'll probably pick four or five to read and dive into deeply over the course of his high school years. Yes. But we're, we're just going to treat it in a different way. That's not going to be a good outsourcing option for that particular child. Whereas for a different one, it was exactly the right one. And, and, and to be clear, that same one has absolutely glommed on to things like Taekwondo. He's expressing an interest in um, uh, like learning anatomy and physiology. And be, because, again, he can see and experience the relevance to what he's trying to do and the things he wants to do. So, mm -hmm. again, delegation is a critical tool and in the toolbox for getting the job done. And understanding that your role, the thing that you are that you are doing most, is making those choices that you, that your job isn't necessarily to teach your job is to choose who's teaching and what's being taught and yeah you and may be you 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 may be choosing yourself as the teacher sometimes but your 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 first job is making those choices right, would you stop crawling underneath me we are <laughs> almost done so in conclusion what are your experiences positive or negative with delegation? Are there any um, uh, any outsourcing you've done that you would recommend, that you would avoid? Um, let us know. Uh, comment in the video. Send us an email. Um, we're on an increasing number of social networks, and she handles all of that, so I have no clue what. Yes, yes. In the show notes, I have got all of the different ways that you can find us on social media. I am striving to at least keep everyone up to date on when I post new blogs, uh, and I will start interacting a little more um, as I make time to be more structured well, you got to delegate some stuff and then you can yes, do some more I actually, social media I, I, I have a list of things <laughs> that i need to delegate so that i have more time for running that because that's you know it's it's a survival strategy and that's ultimately what it is you only have so much time and so many resources you need to make sure that you're spending your time where it matters most and making sure that if something is important it's not that you have to do it. It's just that you have to figure out how and who is going to get it done.
Yeah, absolutely. So with that, let us know if you have any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, thoughts on the speed of a lightning bolt. Let us know what your experience with delegation, either successes or failures might um, might be. And, and we'll see you next week for we'll another see you cup next of week coffee. for another stream. Ciao, ciao.